Matt Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, as I offer these words this morning, I beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In today's uh, gospel passage, what stuck out to me this week as I was thinking about what I would say and praying about what was important to say, there's really right off the top that passage that says, Jesus did not want anybody to know it. Jesus did not want anybody to know it. And if you uh, can think a little bit about this with me, the, uh, the truth is that in the Gospel of Mark, he says this quite often, and you have heard it, and over the next few weeks you're going to hear it again. Somehow he doesn't want people to know who he is and what he's up to. Do not reveal who I am, he says. Keep this a secret. Keep this between us. This whole trend through the Gospel of Mark is called the Messianic secret. The Messianic, that's a fancy word. But it basically means keep this quiet, right? Now, that's not permission for you all to keep who Jesus is quiet, okay? We want to make that clear. He's talking in the Gospel to his disciples. Now, let me say also that um, we really don't know why this is part of this gospel and so prevalent in it. Like, we can guess, we can look, we can read the narrative over and over, but it's clear that this is one of the important themes. And so there are three typically three major reasons why scholars think that this is going on. And I'm going to, that's right, offer three points and a point today so you can keep track of the sermon. There are three major theories about this, and we're going to do the first two quickly and the last one take a little bit longer because that's the one I like the best. Now, some people think that Mark, the author, drafted this story this way in order to explain why Jesus was not immediately seen by the people around him as the Messiah, right? So, so those first followers of Jesus were asking, how, how do, I know, I've received him, I see who he is, how come they not, with all that's going on in this gospel, see who this was? And perhaps they think, for the worst readers of, the, of this first gospel, because that's what this is, that this secret was kind of a slow reveal, Right? that it creates a sense of something is going to happen. And so that the kind of narrative, if you will, the narrative build that's taking place is we're waiting. When will this happen? When are we going to see it? You've got to remember that in Mark's gospel, we're always following the way. And where are we going? They keep asking this, right? And so this messianic secret, this thing that we can see kind of listening on the outside that we are participating in the walk and waiting for his entry into Jerusalem, the cross and resurrection. So that's the first theory. That's the first thing. And and that makes some sense to me. The second theory is this, that it has to do with Jesus as the Christ of God, that the secrecy is for the reader an indicator that we, you and I, are in on something, that the rest don't quite see it. But because we've been baptized, imagine the first readers hearing this, right? Imagine that they are following Jesus. They're some of the first. There's not many of them. And and they're gathering around and they're telling themselves stories that they know something the rest of the world hasn't figured out yet, right? And that the secrecy between us is an indicator that that all the stuff and the acts of power and prophecy and miracles do not actually speak to what Jesus is up to because we know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, right? And that we know the cross is coming. 
and that he may cast out demons and he may be teaching and he may be doing deeds of power like stilling the storm. Like he can do all that stuff. But that's not a revelation of who he is as Messiah. What we know is the cross is coming. And that's, that's really the second theory of the Messianic secret that uh, we're in on it. Uh, and I like being in on it, you know. Uh, and, and so there's that sense of reaffirmation, maybe, for us who gather even here today. Now, for me, this second deep theological truth is so powerful uh, that there is one, uh, is one more, though, which I find personally in my life as a Christian very convincing, okay? So, I mean, it's not a surprise that the one I'm going to spend the most time on is the one that speaks to me personally. But I also think it speaks to our experience of Jesus and uh, the, the broken road uh, that we travel in trying to be faithful Christians. So let me offer this third one and see how it comes across to you all, okay? You may say, I have Bishop, I like this second one. All good, no judgment. Uh, but you're going to spend the rest of the sermon with me on number three. <laughs> and that's this, that keeping the identity secret for Jesus helps us to see how important his teaching and our faith and our understanding is and how often we get it wrong. This kind of gradual revelation of Jesus as the Messiah reveals to us in the narrative how the first followers of Jesus had to come to terms with the fact that the revelation and ministry of Jesus was not going to be what they thought it was. He was not going to overturn the government. He was not just doing good deeds for the poor. That this is a revelation of who God is. And God's agenda is not the same as human agendas. And here, if we focus a little bit, what we begin to understand is there is no perfect faith. There is no perfect faith. <laughs> you can't actually believe enough correctly to get this messianic secret right. And so the pilgrim journey is one that is always fraught with trouble and questions and rabbit trails off to this way and this way because I've got this question today and I've got that question tomorrow and then something happens in my life that takes me down that road. And constantly, by the time we get to the end of it, it tends to be a dead end where we're sitting in front of some burning bush in our lives and God is saying, how many times do I have to tell you I am who I am and I am about something different than what you desire. There's no story in the whole of Scripture. Now, one of you is going to figure out there is, but I spent a whole day thinking about this statement. I don't think that there's one story in the whole of Scripture where anyone, anyone, from Genesis all the way to the very end of, uh, of Revelation, I don't think there's one person who gets it right from the get-go. Not one. They tend to all, men and women, all tend to be trying to figure it out. And that that is the true core of all of the story of Scripture, not just Mark's gospel. In this way, we see he's telling an old, old story. I don't think I can do this, she says. And Mordecai replies, you're called just for a time such as this. Right? I've killed somebody, yet you are calling me to lead the people into freedom? This is not a New Testament story. This is who God is. God has chosen to companion along our earthly pilgrimage with a bunch of people who can't get it right. And no matter how much I wish, this sermon's not going to help you. 
Everything God does in the Holy Scriptures tend to turn upside down the lives of those who get involved. God is not going to confirm your suspicions about how this world should work. Because everything in this world is broken. Because we're in charge of it. And that's why we have to have a cross. So every day we can put our pants on, wake up and say our prayers and get back at it. Knowing that we'll probably fail. But in the midst of failure, I might get an opportunity to do something just good for somebody else. I might get an opportunity to apologize for something that I didn't apologize for yesterday. I might have the opportunity to secretly help somebody who has no clue I'm helping them. I might have an opportunity to sit quietly and read a piece of scripture and come to a new understanding about who I am and who God is with me. But I want to be honest. If you follow this God, your world will be turned upside down. In Mark's gospel, there is a repeated theme that starts with the idea that someone's truth is not Jesus's truth, but an individual truth is going to be the way it is. This is followed after the confrontation and conversation with a very loving and patient Jesus, as far as I can tell, who explains how we misunderstand. The person realizes this and either does two things. They either give up and walk away because this is a God not of their making or they decide to follow a little bit more. And I want to focus on that right now. We do not have a choice about the world that we live in and its brokenness. But we do have a choice about how we will live in that world. And no matter what happens over the next few months, as you look for a new priest, as we go through an election, as we deal with all this stuff, here's the truth. God and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday as today and will be tomorrow. And knows, because of the long relationship with us, that we're going to kind of mess things up one way or the other, even if we get our way. But God is present and knows that through this, through returning on a weekly basis, and I think this is really important. I think too often we're like, okay, people, we understand you're really busy. I get it. Every week you have to spend some time with Jesus. I don't care how you do it, but you have to be reminded you're not in control. You are powerless. And only a God who can be God can save you. You have to come into terms with that on a regular basis. And remember that after you confess... Those things, you know, with assurance, right? So here's the thing. With assurance, we know Jesus died on the cross for us, and we're going to be okay, right? Like, we know that. That's in here. Now, we may not have faith that that's true, that everything's going to be okay. We may every day think that we don't have enough faith for that, though we were told over and over again, and just last week or a couple weeks ago, we're told about a mustard seed faith and all that, blah, 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 blah. We may know it, but it's hard for us to live it. So we come in, and every Sunday we have confession, a group confession, and we enter that group confession knowing that we failed. We don't give you enough time to actually come up with a long list because we're Episcopalians and get nervous about quiet. <laughs> but I'm telling you, we ought to be like coming in with the list. Right? We ought to do, as my friends in, uh, that are steppers know, we ought to do that fearless moral inventory on a regular basis and come in here and know exactly how we fail because only then can we say and be reminded that God's grace is bigger than our failures. And then as we go through, we come up here and we come to this altar 
with nothing to give, as our scripture said today. Nothing we have is worthy of what you receive here. It's just, it's God's God. We're not, right? I mean, come on. This is God bigger than you can imagine. There's nothing we have that God didn't create or make. No, we don't have anything. We give from the measliness of who we are. And we come up here to this altar and we put our hands out like this with nothing in them. And we receive a wafer and we receive wine. And the meaning of that is so profound because it's free. The meaning of it is that God's love and grace is big enough for everything that came before and everything that comes after. And it is free and it precedes you out into the world. And you come here and you remember it's all going to be okay. No matter what happens, my faith can be reminded. It's not all on me. Now, you will not truly, I think, capture the depth of this unless you spend some time to it. But I, but I want to end with your poem. <laughs> Three points and a point. And it's a hymn. And I think most of you in the room know that hymn, know this hymn. But listen to its words as I conclude our time together this morning. And think about the assurance that imbues every part of our time together today. Blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Harriet Tubman said, I didn't want to tell him about Jesus because I didn't want him to take him away. Jesus is mine. A foretaste of glory divine. Heir I am an heir. As Paul reminds us over and over again, I'm an heir of salvation. Just as all of you are, I am an heir of salvation. I am the purchase of God. That means that God holds me by the very nature of just being me. Born of the Spirit, right? Born of the Spirit and washed in his blood. That sense that the cross is the way and at the very core. And then what? This is my story. This is my song. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. That's the gospel right there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter, at Texas Bishop, and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.